stop it. Good morning. My name is Craig Schaefer. I'm one of the pastors at St. Mark's. Welcome to our live stream this morning. We will start formally in just a minute. You might want to use that minute to look up our passages. So our Old Testament passage is from Psalm 118. Uh, we finished our Amos readings last week, so Psalm 118. And our Hebrews passage will begin at Hebrews 12, verse 28. And so you might want to look those up. If you uh, want to take some notes during the sermon, um, then you'll find the outline at stmarks.com.au forward slash live that you can have on your phone or you can print out. Um, and each week we have question time at St Mark's and the other thing that you'll find on that page is uh, the number for question time. You can text in questions uh, and there it is on the screen as well. So those are the things you want to get sorted out. Uh, obviously, if you're going to take some notes, grab a pen. Uh, we will uh, be welcoming Scott uh, Maxwell into the pulpit this morning. Scott's one of our members who will be preaching for us. And we are at the back end of the book of Hebrews. So we've been working through Hebrews for a while. We have reached chapter 13. And Hebrews has been encouraging us to run the race of faith with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And if we do that, and we do the other stuff Hebrews has urged us to do, if we see clearly Jesus as our eternal high priest... Uh, if we know that he's the one who's washed us clean so that we can draw near to God's throne of grace with confidence, if we know all of that, what difference does it make in the nitty-gritty of our everyday lives? Well, chapter 13 is about that. And so uh, will you pray with me that God will work in us this morning as his word is read and preached as we come before him in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your goodness and your grace and your wisdom. And we thank you for the way that Hebrews has laid those great truths before us. And we pray that your spirit will continue to work today as your word is read and preached. Father, fill us with faith in Jesus, our eternal high priest. Cause us to fix our eyes on him and enable us to run the race of faith that you have laid out before us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So our Old Testament reading today is from Psalm 118, which you will notice is referenced in Hebrews 13. And Katrina Clifford from our 10 o'clock congregation, she's going to come and read for us. Good morning, everyone. I'll be reading Psalm 118, beginning at verse 1. Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. 
Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O oh Lord, save us. O oh Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Our New Testament reading is from Hebrews, chapter 12, starting at verse 28. Hebrews 12. Therefore... Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honoured by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices... God is pleased. Good morning. Well, uh, I wonder if you've ever received a really significant gift, uh, something special or costly or precious, and maybe a family heirloom, maybe a large gift of money, maybe a house, a car, a business. Or maybe there's a gift that you haven't received yet, like a nest egg set aside for the time when you uh, graduate or you get married. 
or maybe it's an inheritance or a will. Now, what is an acceptable response to a gift like that? I can probably think of a, a bunch of unacceptable responses, can't we? But what would be some unacceptable responses? Firstly, we could dismiss the gift. Uh, we could treat the gift like it's not really that valuable, not really that precious. Maybe we don't use it. Maybe we use it, but we don't treasure it or cherish it. Like the gift that gets dumped in a corner and forgotten about or treated like it's nothing and thrown away. Or another unacceptable way to respond to a gift like that could be to get so wrapped up, so enthralled in the gift itself that we focus on it and fixate on it, but pay no attention to the giver. A bit like a kid at a party who greedily opens up all of his presents but doesn't even stop to thank the people who've given them to him. And another unacceptable response to a great gift would be to try and earn the gift back. Now, I'm sure we've all given someone a gift and then had that awkward response where they feel like they need to pay you back for it. But that defeats the purpose of a gift. Yeah, I don't want you to repay me for the gift. It's a gift. I gave it to you. Now, this week and next, as we come to the very end of the book of Hebrews... Uh, which is a book, a letter, that speaks all about the greatest gift ever given by the greatest giver. See, throughout Hebrews, we've seen that Jesus brought the best news ever because Jesus brings the best gift ever. And he did that by becoming the best sacrifice ever, which means that anyone who trusts in him has the best future ever. And this future is described here in verse 28, as a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Now, this kingdom is an eternal and heavenly kingdom. It's a, it's a kingdom, a world, a new creation where God's people will live forever without pain, without sadness, without suffering or sickness or fear or trouble. It will never end. This really is the best gift ever. And so, as we come to the very end of Hebrews... We're focusing here on the only acceptable way to respond to a gift like that. And it's none of those things I just mentioned. It's not to ignore the gift or act like it doesn't mean anything. It's not to focus on the gift itself. It's not to try and earn back the gift or pay God back for it. Now we see here that the only acceptable response is to live a life of thankful awestruck worship to God the giver. Verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. So the big question for us this morning, big question for you and for me, are you offering acceptable worship to God? Are you responding rightly to this gift that he has given? Are you responding like someone who is awestruck and thankful and smitten by the giver who has given us this incredible gift? Well, it's time for us to stop dismissing this gift. It's time for us to stop ignoring the giver. It's time for us to stop trying to earn or pay back the giver for that gift. It's time for us to worship God acceptably. Well, what does acceptable worship look like? Firstly, it looks like sacrifice and disgrace. Come down to verse 11. Now, this is speaking back to the old covenant. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so... Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Now the old sacrifices were full of symbolism. 
the priest would lay his hands on the, the animal to be sacrificed and would symbolically place the sin of the people on the animal. And now that that animal carried that sin, it was like it was infected and it had to be treated a bit like we would treat a corpse infected with coronavirus. It had to be taken away. It was unclean. It was untouchable. And they were taken outside the city and burned. And that symbol was pointing forward to Jesus. Because Jesus literally took our sin on himself. And he too was taken outside the city. He too was treated like someone who is infected. And he bore the disgrace of being rejected and mocked and outcast. But he bore that disgrace because he was looking forward to something better. He became an outcast so that he could give us a kingdom. He wore that disgrace so that we could belong to that heavenly city. And so the logic here is that since we have a better heavenly city, a better city than this one, a better world than this one, a better kingdom than this one, where we really do belong, we're free to stop trying to belong in this one. We're free to stop trying to fit in here in this earthly city. We're free to, like Jesus, bear disgrace for the sake of him. Free to place all of our eggs in the basket of that city that is to come. Even if it means we get mocked and picked on and treated like idiots by people who have all their eggs in the basket of this life and this world and this city. Let us go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore, for we are looking for the city that is to come. That's not all, is it? See, now that Jesus has paid the sacrifice that we could never pay, now that he's paid the sacrifice that took away our sin and made us right with God, we're free to live our lives as a different kind of sacrifice. And if we look down at verses 15 and 16, they kind of sum up this passage. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. See, our lips and our lives, every part of our life, now becomes a sacrifice of thanks and praise. Our lives become a sacrifice that declares that Jesus is the best giver and he has given us the best gift. And that word sacrifice is actually important because it reminds us that acceptable worship costs. It is a sacrifice. If we truly follow Jesus, it will bring disgrace. We need to stop and ask, don't we? Are you looking for the city that is to come? Is your hope and your home and your identity and your belonging in that city or is it in this one? Are you prepared to be mocked and outcast and in this world, in this life? Are you more worried about belonging and fitting in here than in the city that is to come? See, this isn't that Christianity light that's become so popular. This isn't follow Jesus and life is easy and sweet and everybody will love you. We need to go to Jesus and bear the disgrace that he bore. Are you willing to do that? Well, Jesus spoke very strongly about what it looks like to follow him. These are some of Jesus' words. He said, If anyone wants to come to me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. This is the kind of worship that is acceptable to God. So where are your eggs Which basket have you placed them in? I think you and I need to repent. 
We need to repent of loving this world and loving our reputations and loving our comfort too much. We need to repent of loving this world and placing all of our treasure here and we need to look for the coming city. We need to go to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace that he bore, living lives of sacrificial worship. What does that sacrificial worship look like? Uh, It's great that we have this list here in chapter 13 and uh, there's just so much gold in there and we could spend a whole series unpacking uh, each of these points, but uh, this morning we're just going to focus on two. We're going to hone in on two ways that acceptable worship plays out in the way that we love people. Firstly, in the way that we worship with sacrificial love towards Christians in the church. And secondly, the way that we worship with sacrificial love towards those outside the church. Verse 1. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Now, acceptable worship of God means sacrificial love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. That makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, If we have a city and a kingdom that we are receiving and we are going to, as fellow citizens, spend eternity together serving and loving each other, it makes sense that here now we will start. Now, at at, uh, one church that I was at, uh, there was a a little old lady uh, who every week, everyone was kind of seated in sort of around the middle of the church And there was this one lady who sat right out on the far corner, right at the end of a pew, all by herself. Uh, And I would go and I would sit with her. And I remember one morning I said, oh, look, why are you sitting all the way out here? Why don't you go and, you know, sit with other people? She said, oh, look, when the church was being built, uh, they needed some money for pews. And I bought this pew. I, I donated money. This is my pew. And I remember feeling like saying to her, well, Would you like me to load it in your car for you? You can take it home and come sit with everybody else. See, loving people sacrificially means that actually we care about each other. It means that we will invest in each other. It means that we won't be sitting out on the end of a pew. Now, in my time here over the last uh, 18 months as a member of St Mark's, I've seen a lot of really great and encouraging examples of sacrificial love and care. And I don't know how long you've been here with us, but in your time, I'm sure you have too. Great examples of brotherly love. But I've also noticed that we could do a whole lot better. See, there are still lots of people who are slipping through the cracks. There are still people who, sitting at the end of pews, no one sits next to them. Still people who get left out and avoided. There are still people who bear grudges against each other. People in this church who see each other each Sunday and yet don't work towards reconciliation. There are still people who are happy to keep their relationships with people at church contained to that time when they come here into this building on a Sunday and then to have nothing to do with each other for the rest of the week. There are still people who find themselves left on the outer, outside of all the cliques and the friendship groups. There are still people who see others' needs, but just assume, well, someone else will take care of that. It's funny, sometimes I come to church and as the kids go out and it's time to chat to each other, I see people sitting next to each other or in front of each other or behind each other and they don't even turn their heads to say hello and good morning and how are you. There are people in our church who are going through tremendous suffering and grief and pain and yet feel like they're going through it alone. See, we need to be a people who respond with acceptable worship to God, of sacrificial love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I I haven't seen it myself at St Mark's, 
But I suspect in a church of this size, there might even be some people who've actually given up on Jesus. Because in their time with us, they couldn't see that an eternity with God's people was really something to look forward to. I'd suspect that there are people who have actually walked away from Jesus from our midst, partly because they didn't feel that they were actually loved by God's people. And so I've got a question to ask yourself, a little diagnostic. We've had three months of restrictions and that's made things tricky and challenging and in some ways it's, it's brought out some of the great things about how we do love each other, but in some ways it's also shown the cracks. So here's a question. During the last three months of restrictions, about 90 days, how many people from church, from St Mark's, have you gone out of your way to contact and have a meaningful contact and engagement with? How many people in the last three months have you had a phone call with? Have you written to? Have you started a communications and messages and... How many people have you asked how they're going, what you can pray for, if there's anything they need that you can provide? And have you been in touch with any people who are on the fringe, those people outside of your immediate friendship circles? And what about before that? What about before COVID? How often did you have people from church in your home? How often did you catch up with someone for a coffee or a play date? How often did you make a time and effort to meet with someone or to speak with someone and ask how they're going and how you can pray for them? As I've been reading Hebrews 13 over the past weeks, I've been convicted actually that I haven't done a fantastic job at loving my brothers and sisters like I should have. I've seen huge cracks in my own life, in my own worship, And of course, it costs. It is, after all, a sacrifice. Loving each other costs time. It costs emotional energy. It costs commitment and thoughtfulness. It costs vulnerability. It means inviting each other into our lives, looking after each other's needs. It means checking in and meeting up and praying and asking and encouraging. It's costly. But that's what acceptable worship is. So I want to give you a challenge. You've done some diagnostic. Here's a two-part challenge. The first part is go and make a list. People from your congregation. And and in this list, it, it, it doesn't have to be a huge list, it doesn't have to be everyone. It could be a dozen people, it could be 20 people, it could be 30. And make sure it's a mix of different people, people that you're close to, but also people you're not. Uh, people who, and particularly pay attention, people who you don't think are particularly well looked after. People on the fringe or the edges, new people. And start by praying for them. That's the first step in loving. And then I want to challenge you, just try and make contact with one person a day. That's not too hard, it might just be a text, it might be a WhatsApp message, it might be a call. Might be an email. How are you going? I just prayed for you today. And and once you've done that, you've come up with that list, do something about it so it actually happens. Plan when you're going to do it. Are you going to do it in your lunch break? Are you going to do it first thing in the morning? Are you going to do it before you go to bed? Set reminders in your calendar and do it. And, and now that restrictions of these, this is the second part of my challenge... Why don't you invite someone to come each week with you and join you in your home for church together? Now, if you're a family, you don't just have to invite other families. If you're a couple, you don't just have to invite other couples or a single or older or younger. It doesn't matter. Mix it up. If you're a family, invite a single. If you're a single, invite a couple. And the same principle applies. Think of people who who need reaching out to Look for people on the fringe. Make a list, make a plan, get on your phone, start teeing it up. Let us worship God with sacrificial love towards each other.
And secondly, let us worship God with sacrificial love towards strangers. Verse 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, the word entertain here is actually uh, a really unhelpful translation. Uh, what's being described here is the biblical concept of hospitality. And, and for many of us, what is a very deep and rich concept, I think for a lot of us, it's kind of boiled down to a rather shallow picture. I think many of us think like the translators did here and, and they take this concept of hospitality and, and we just boil it down to entertaining. But hospitality isn't about entertaining. The word here actually literally means the love of strangers. In verse 1, the word is love of brothers and in verse 2, the word is love of strangers. Hospitality is about loving strangers. When you think about it, hospitality is right at the heart of the gospel. As we've been reminded this morning, Jesus showed his hospitality. He bore the disgrace and sacrificed himself as an act of love to us while we were strangers and enemies. And if we go to him, we too will show that same kind of sacrificial love to strangers. Well, will that include inviting people to lunch? Of course. But it's also deeper and broader, isn't it? See, acceptable worship means that we will sacrificially open up our lives, our homes, our wallets, our hearts to love people that we don't know, to serve their needs. And there's a lot of work in doing that, isn't there? A lot of work in thinking, what are people's needs? How do I love these people? Now, uh, back uh, a few years now, in 2016, uh, members of this church filled out a survey. It's called the National Church Life Survey. You might remember doing it. Uh, and one of the questions in there was about what you think your gifts and your skills are. And you know what the, the highest... Uh, the highest number of applicants replied as their gift and skills at St Mark's it was hospitality. 45% of St Mark's members ticked their number one gifts and skills as hospitality. And I've seen some people really great at this. Uh, when we came as new members, as strangers to St Mark's, we had... Uh, some people here show us real genuine, beautiful hospitality. People who made an effort to get to know us, who made an effort to befriend us, who welcomed us into their home and their lives, uh, people who cared for us when we were sick, uh, people who even actually helped out when we were in financial distress. And you know what? One of the great things is that I know there's so much great hospitality going on in the background that nobody sees. But I think if we're honest, and if we're really as gifted in sacrificially loving strangers as we indicated that we are, we shouldn't have a single newcomer come through the doors at St Mark's who doesn't leave having been welcomed and greeted and listened to and cared for and had interest shown in them by at least a few people. There shouldn't be anyone who leaves, visits St Mark's and leaves feeling like only the staff really cared about them. We shouldn't have anyone leave who doesn't feel like we are a people who love and care for strangers. And when we hear of people in the wider community in need, we should be the first to help. Now, it's costly, isn't it? Investing in strangers isn't always rewarding. It's not always fun. It can be pretty awkward. It can be hard work. It will be time consuming and it will be expensive. And you know, sometimes people might even think you're crazy for giving so much of yourself to people that you don't know. But this is what acceptable worship looks, looks like. This is what people who are receiving a kingdom do out of thanks and awe for the one 
who has shown hospitality to them. Now I want to encourage you to make some practical steps. And to keep it easy, I'm going to make them the same steps as before. Start with praying. Pray that you will be someone who shows hospitality, who shows love to strangers. Pray that God will help you see the needs of those around you. Pray that when we come back and we're able to meet together in this building, pray that God will open your eyes to be able to see people who are new, people who have not been here before, people who have been brought by a friend, people who have walked in off the street. Pray that God will help you see people in our community, in your street, who you can show love to. Come up with a list. Think of some practical ways that you're going to start reaching out and building relationship and showing love and taking an interest in people. Why don't you see if you can just once a week have somebody around. Once a week have someone for a coffee or meet at the park or at the cafe. Once a week show love to a stranger in a practical way. Well, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. What a gift. We have been shown incredible hospitality while we were strangers. Jesus went outside the camp and bore the disgrace so that we could receive a city that will endure. How are we going to respond to that gift? Are we going to try and earn it back? Are we going to treat it like it's nothing? Are we going to focus so much on the gift that we ignore the giver? Let us worship God acceptably. Let us look to the coming city. Let us bear disgrace for Christ. And let us worship with sacrificial love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the incredible gift you have given through your Son. We thank you that he bore disgrace in order to cleanse us of our sin, to make us right with you, in order to make us citizens of the heavenly city. And we pray, Lord, that you would work in us, that we would worship you acceptably, that you would so fill us with love for our brothers and sisters in Christ and for strangers, for those we do not know, for those outside of your church, that we would be people who sacrificially love. Amen. We're going to give Scott a chance to sit down for a minute and then will be our Q&A. So if you had a question, I encourage you to be texting the number, uh, the um, question in, the number is there on the screen. Um, uh, just while you're doing that, uh, there are a few things I wanted uh, to bring to your attention. Firstly, each week, there's the communication there on the website at stmarks.com.au forward slash live. Uh, if you're new to St Marks and you've only joined us sort of via live stream, we'd love to connect with you. And so you can use the communication card to do that. If you are new and you don't have a Bible of your own yet, put that on the communication card and we'll give you one as a gift. Um, give us your details and we'll get one to you. The communication card is also an opportunity uh, to put in prayer points. So if you've got stuff that you'd like somebody to be praying about alongside you, if you put the communication, if you put that on the communication card, then I'll be praying about that this week. So I encourage everybody to do a communication card, even if it's just to say hi. Um, uh, so that's a communication card. The second thing, each week after our live stream, we have our virtual morning tea uh, via Zoom a chance to uh, connect with uh, people from across our congregations, 15, 20 minutes, a chance to pray, um, to say hi. And if you've never been on, maybe you're new to St Mark's and you don't know everybody, well, here's a great way to get to know a few people. Uh, if you just, you know, you've been here forever and you haven't got on, I encourage you, Zoom morning tea, lots of fun. You meet some new people, you connect with some old ones. If you don't have the details, uh, then put that on your communication card and we'll send you the link as soon as live stream's over. So that starts at 11.45 and goes for about 15, 20 minutes. For the families, a reminder that uh, our Hawk online program is not far away now. Um, great opportunity to 
uh, spend time thinking about God's word together, but also to connect others. So kids at school might have mates uh, who could come over and share an afternoon. They could watch it together, do some stuff together, and maybe families, again, an opportunity to extend hospitality to strangers. The parents of uh, your kids' friends, why not invite them over for a meal before or after Hawk Online? Uh, so if you go to the um, St Mark website, you'll find a link with lots more information. I um, encourage you to do that. It's going to be all sorts of fun. I've seen them doing prep stuff this week. Uh, looks a bit crazy. Uh, and the final thing I wanted to mention is Scott uh, will also be doing a thing for us on Monday night um, to help us get better at helping other people come to know Jesus. So we know that it's part of what it is to be one of Jesus' disciples. You want to help other people see uh, the glory and the goodness of who he is and what he's done. Um, and sometimes, though, we could use some practical equipping in that. Well, uh, that's what Monday night's going to be about. So, um, again, I put all the details in the weekly email. Uh, but if you don't get that, mention on your communication card that you're interested and we'll send you the link that you need uh, for Monday night. Uh, that's everything that I had. Scott, you ready to... Yep, he's going to hop up again and answer some questions. Hi, Scott. Um, the first question here is, how do we... You talked about focusing on the city to come. How do we keep our eyes fixed on the city to come rather than getting distracted with the here and now? Yeah, great question. Uh, look, I think... Um, God's given us the greatest uh, gift and uh, tool for that, and that's his word. Um, if you look throughout, just, you know, scan back over Hebrews, and uh, what's, what does it start with? Well, it starts with God has spoken to us through his son. Uh, and and it, again and again throughout, it says, you know, don't ignore him, uh, don't neglect. And so it's, it's as we hear God's word pointing us forward, uh, because... Without God's word, all we have to look at is, is what's here. But God's word, it, it, it's, it's like binoculars that, that point us forward to reality, uh, point us forward to Jesus uh, and keep reminding us. Um, and it, look, you know, I think, so if you're not in God's word regularly, uh, all you're going to see is this world. Uh, but the other thing is that actually we need each other. Uh, and this is part of where what it looks like to really genuinely sacrificially love each other is to keep encouraging and pointing each other, as Hebrews already has said, meeting together, uh, pointing each other forward to Jesus, reminding each other, hey, you know, I notice you've been talking a lot about, you know, this new car you want or uh, the new renovations you want to do. Um, you know, I'm just, just wondering, it seems like, you know, you're quite focused on that. Um, and, and encouraging each other, like, uh, are we living for this city or are we living for one to come? Uh, so God's word, stay in it uh, and stay in relationship with each other and encourage each other to keep looking forward, yeah. Thanks, Scott. Um, question about verse 2 and the angels. Are these literal angels or people who love Jesus who we don't know or what's going on there? Yeah, I knew that one was coming. <laughs> um, yeah, the angels. Well... Literal angels, yeah. So I think it just means what it says. Uh, do not forget to love strangers, for by doing this, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Uh, now, I think uh, what probably most obviously that's pointing back to is pointing back to events in Israel's history when this actually happened. Um, I mean, just back, back two chapters in Hebrews 11, we've already kind of done a scan through Israel's history, and some of the people mentioned there actually, uh, they actually did show hospitality, show love, uh, provide for the needs of strangers who turned out to be angels. So we think of Lot, we think of Abram, uh, Gideon, um, Samson's uh, parents, whose names escape me. Um, yeah, so some people actually have. Uh, and look, it's possible that some of us might unknowingly also, this verse indicates, actually show hospitality to strangers who are in fact angels. Uh, but I think what's probably an even bigger <laughs> uh, encouragement uh, to show hospitality is, is Jesus' words himself, where Jesus says that 
uh, he talks about people who on judgment day will stand before him and Jesus says that actually how you treated strangers, how you treated people on earth, you are actually treating me. And so while it may be true that, yeah, maybe in entertaining strangers, you might actually entertain an angel. But definitely in, in sorry, not entertaining, definitely in loving strangers, you are definitely showing love to Christ. Uh, so that's a great, great encouragement to keep doing that. Um, you mentioned um, trying to show love to newcomers at church. What might that practically look like to show hospitality to newcomers at church? Could you step us through some, some ideas mm. there? Yeah, great. I mean, you could start by thinking, well, if I was new at a church, uh, what, what would I want people to do? I know we're not all the same. Uh, but, of course, the first step's got to be that someone actually takes some interest in you. Uh, the most basic thing is just walk up and say hello. <laughs> oh, g'day, I'm Scott, I haven't met you before. Um, what's your name? Great to have you here. You know, how did you come to be here today? And, you know, just normal conversation of someone who cares about another person's life, you know. Tell me about yourself, your family, your, you know, what are your interests? It's just... You don't have to be a fantastic conversationalist. Honest, I'm not. Uh, the biggest thing, smile, say good day, ask someone how they're going. Um, that's, that's a really practical way. Uh, but of course, if it, if it only just... It's the same with all of what we've been talking about today. If that only just stays at your time here in the building where we meet, uh, that's pretty shallow. Um, and so some of the best hospitality we've been shown as when we've visited new churches is we've gone to churches where we've rocked up a church, some people have said g'day, and they said, hey, what are you doing after church? Do you want to come and have, have lunch with us, have dinner with us? You know, we're going out to a cafe. Um, that kind of taking an interest in invite, welcoming people into our lives and our homes and our families and, uh, yeah, an ongoing, um, in an ongoing way. Um, you talked about making, um, getting to know people who are strangers. What would it look like to go about making connections with those sorts of new people, um, people who we don't yet know? Mm. Well, I mean, uh, you, you meet strangers all the time, don't we? Um, actually, we're going to be talking a little bit about this uh, tomorrow night. Uh, so just thinking about how there are different sort of types of of scenarios in which we meet people in different kinds of relationships and, and, uh, uh, and contexts. Um, but, I mean, I, I want to go back to that last one. I mean, a similar thing. You meet someone by the school, school gate at pick-up. Uh, you meet someone on the train. Uh, you meet some neighbours. First thing, if you love someone, you're going to be interested in them. Uh, so you want to smile, say good day, get to know them a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, beyond that as well, we actually have opportunities that come our way to show love to people. Uh, because people in life, life is messy, and people are hurting, people are going through hard things, and there are actual ways that we can love them in that. Um, I've seen people get together, uh, in Christians, in churches, where maybe one person from church has a contact with someone in the community and they know they're struggling um, and then a whole group of people in the church who've never even met this person have loved them. Maybe it's providing meals, maybe it's actually been putting together some money in a hat to help someone through a hard financial time. Um, there's, there are lots of ways. Uh, and look, you know, if, if we're struggling with this again, we've got each other to help each other. You know, hey, look, I've, I've been talking with this neighbour. I'm not really sure how to help him. Brother, what do you reckon I should do? Uh, I asked my wife because she's much more cluey about this stuff than I am. Um, last one. Um, how can we be welcoming and inclusive of others if seeking to love others um, when life feels so full at the moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. We've got a, I think 
we always have to be going back and saying, well, why is life full? What is life full with? Uh, because what happens is life, like a bucket, you know, it, it just fills up. And if you're not constantly kind of scooping out water, um, it'll stay full. And so we, we've got to go, well, what actually really matters? What are the most important things? Uh, am I loving my spouse if I have one? Am I working to disciple them and point them to Jesus? Am I loving my kids if I have them? Am I discipling them? Uh, am, am I loving those in my church uh, around me? Um, and as you work through, all of us have fat to trim. Um, I've got a list of unfinished projects because I start a project and then I get into it and I realise, hang on, what am I doing this for? This doesn't last, it doesn't matter. And so I get rid of it and I, I focus again on some things that matter more. But then another one creeps in. Uh, and it's like that with all of us. Uh, there's always fat to trim. Uh, and so prayerfully, just go back to your, to your calendar, to your life. Uh, what here is not eternal, what here is not going to last. Let's focus on what does. It may be things uh, from God's word this morning that have challenged you in different ways that have made you go, yeah, actually, there are things that I should have trimmed that I haven't or there have been opportunities to show love that I haven't taken because it was costly uh, there are all sorts of ways in which we haven't lived the truths that God's word has laid before us this morning. And this is the nature of sin. And it's right that God's people confess those things and repent of them, turn away from them, and seek God's strength uh, to uh, do what he calls us to do as acceptable worship, like to love, to... Um, uh, the brother and the stranger. And so it's right that we confess those things and we're going to do that in words that will appear on the screen now. And I invite you to pray this with me. Let's pray together. Most merciful God, we humbly admit that we need your help. We confess that we have wandered from your way. We have done wrong and we have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us, wipe out our sins, and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth in us the fruit of the Spirit, that we may live as disciples of Christ. This we ask in the name of Jesus our Saviour. Amen. And it's important that we remember that Jesus who went outside the camp for us, who experienced that disgrace, did it as a sacrifice, a sacrifice in our place so that our sins are atoned for. And so God's people need to be confident that we can approach the throne of grace knowing that our sins are forgiven by God. And so Psalm 103 is one of the places where God tells us that in his word. We're reminded the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And so we can approach his throne of grace with confidence, and Paul Whiting is going to come and lead us in prayer as we do that. Thanks, Paul. Let's come before our great God, recognising the tremendous privilege we have of bowing before the creator of the universe. And we come in the name of our Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning, first of all, to thank you for all your blessings to us. 
Thank you that you have allowed us to live in this peaceful country. Thank you that you have invited us into your family and assured us of your love and your eternal salvation. Thank you because you are the only God, the great God in whose hands are the depths and the height of this world and indeed of the universe. The land, the sea, Everything in them are the work of your hands. You created them, and although we have spoilt so much of your creation, yet you have promised that you will redeem it. Thank you that you are our God, and we are the people you care for. And although you are above all creation, yet you have chosen to live with people who are contrite and humble and we thank you. Thank you that we can hear you speak to us as we read your word and your spirit speaks to our need for wisdom, comfort and confidence in life. Now, Father, we want to pray this morning for our leaders in your church. Bless especially your servant Luke, our associate pastor, as he gets to know the 415 congregation here. May he be an encouragement to them and they to him. But we also pray that you will grant to him the grace of your spirit in his family life with Gemma. Bless him as a husband and father with wisdom, patience and love. And enable him to grow more like our Lord Jesus day by day. We ask that you will bless and keep his family in your love. And Father, we pray as well for the leaders of our country. We pray for our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and the leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese. We pray for Scott's witness as one of your people. May he be true to you and led by your spirit in everything he says, decides, and does. We pray for all our state premiers, and ask that they will be wise in the way they direct the lifting of restrictions and that we too will be wise in the way we conduct ourselves at this stage of the pandemic. We pray especially <clears throat> for the leaders and people in Victoria as they cope with rising cases of the virus. And as we move towards regathering as your assembled people, help us to do so with care for everyone but let us not lose our desire to once again be together as the assembly of your people, the church. <clears throat> Father, we pray for your people <clears throat> who serve you by bringing the message of salvation to others around the world. We pray that you will bless our link missionaries, David and <clears throat> Suri Anderson, as they continue with the production of scriptures in the languages of Indonesia. Thank you that David has been successful in checking the whole book of Ruth in the Bam Bam language, despite the poor internet connections in that remote community. We pray also for the work on the Nuntush translation, now on hold because of the pandemic. Will you allow the final stages of the production of the Life of Christ videos in Thai to proceed despite the current difficulties? And Father, as we think of these matters of eternal salvation, we pray for that country, Indonesia. We ask that you will inspire their leaders <clears throat> with a determination to ensure that Christians can meet without obstruction and be free to make the offer of salvation to others. And we ask that you will give boldness, perseverance, protection and courage to your missionaries in that country. We pray also for wisdom for the government of Indonesia in attempting to control the acceleration of the virus in that country. Thank you, Father, that today we have again been able to hear your word explained. So we pray that you will enable us to think more about other people and their needs than about ourselves. 
We pray too that you will preserve our marriages and make them a reflection of your love for us in Christ. Please also help the leaders in our church not only to be faithful in preaching and teaching the Bible, but to live out the truth of your word in lives that display the glory of our Lord Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray all these things. Amen. brother our time draws to its end we're going to finish with a couple of songs that help us to reflect a bit more on uh, some of the themes that uh, we've seen today in hebrews 13 uh, you might also if you haven't done your communication card yet i encourage you to do that and then 11 45 uh, we'll be on zoom for virtual morning tea but pray with me now Heavenly Father, thank you that your son was willing to suffer disgrace that we might inherit that heavenly city. Father, fill us with faith and joy in him, faith and joy that leads us to worship you acceptably, cause us to love as we have been loved, to love brothers and sisters in Christ like that, to love strangers like that. And Father, uh, we pray that you might be glorified as we do and that the name of Jesus may be lifted up. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. See you shortly on Zoom.
that final day when fears are gone cast far away we'll live secure trust in his love never Christ is with us, he's with Washed away. Now let us draw near the holiest place. Our hearts full. 